Hello, everyone. I'm Val. I am one of the organizers of the Bloom program and really excited to have this fireside today uh, with Boardroom. So I am currently in transit, so I don't have my video on, um, but I will just let the Boardroom team uh, take it away from here. And um, I've made Kevin co-host. I'll, I'll let you all take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Val. Hey, everyone. Great to meet you. Um, so we're going to keep this uh, super casual. Again, you know, fireside chat. We want um, you guys to interrupt us with questions as we walk through um, a, a few agenda items. Um, we're going to give a quick overview of the DAO ecosystem, what DAOs are, um, where Boardroom fits into that market as well, why we're building what we're building, what kind of what the product looks like as well. Um, then we're going to dive into just like a casual conversation about working in the web free space. Um, I think a lot of folks uh, from the boardroom team have some super interesting perspectives. They've all recently transitioned from, um, you know, traditional web two, the traditional web two space into web three. Um, so they have a lot of like very interesting learnings about their experience that, that uh, they're here to share with us too. Um, and then finally, we can give a quick overview about like what it's like to work um, at boardroom, how we structure our culture, our team, um, and we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. But um, we definitely want this to be super interactive, um, you know, ask questions, shoot out stuff, interrupt us at any point in time, post stuff in the chat. Um, we want to keep it really, really casual and just have like a conversation about what it's honestly like to work in Web3. Um, so with that being said, uh, the first thing I'll do is give a quick overview of what DAOs are, why they're important, and um, how they fit into the ecosystem, as well as how Boardroom fits into um, the ecosystem. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Hopefully all of you guys can see this. I'm just going to run through a couple articles um, that have like some descriptions that I found useful to kind of like frame um, how the industry has evolved, what DAOs um, are and how they how they behave in the space. So to put it super simply, I'll, I'll do this in like five minutes really quickly, but if anyone has any questions, please, please interrupt me. Um, so to put it simply, DAOs are, you know, decentralized autonomous orgs. They're just structures, mechanisms for folks to coordinate online through a set of rules that are enforced on the blockchain, right? And these rules are enforced through smart contracts that we call governance frameworks. Um, and the point being, they're, they're essentially there to just set a structure around how a set of distributed stakeholders that are online, a lot of the times completely pseudonymous, right? I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of craziness in crypto Twitter and discords and all these different things. You know, all these contracts are there to do is essentially enforce a set of parameters and rules around how we make decisions about um, you know, the future of this community, the future of this platform, the future of this network. For the most part, those are enforced on chain um, through everything from token voting to more complex and dynamic voting mechanisms. But a lot of the discussion, a lot of the discourse um, actually happens off chain, as you could imagine, right? As with any governance system, as with any decision making system, um, a lot of the things that happen do happen off chain. The on-chain contract and the on-chain mechanisms are almost there to kind of ratify decision decision making from all of these like distributed stakeholders all over the world into like an execution that happens you know for the protocol or for that community um that could be everything from like a treasury distribution from a dao treasury contract to you know a curation mechanism where you're allowing new members into your dao or distributing power to different folks or even you know on the more technical side these can be like smart contract upgrades they can be actual changes to the to the to the code itself as well um and we will see in a bit that like we've developed Develop different governance frameworks and different governance structures um, to actually enable this wide, um, you know, variety of use cases, um, depending on why your DAO exists. Um, and we'll dive into this a bit. But you know, um, very simply, the, the initial concept of a DAO was actually coined by Vitalik in 2014, right? So this concept of like a coordination mechanism for distributed stakeholders um, online um, that it is enforced through some on-chain smart contract and usually a token um, was actually you know pushed forward by Vitalik in 2014. But it wasn't really until like 2017 that the idea really started booming and folks started building infrastructure around it. What we've seen in the last year though is that as more and more activity like really shifted towards the digital realm, folks started realizing that these communities um, that lived online could function way more effectively and scale way quicker 
if they actually had these sets of rules that were enforced on chain and weren't necessarily dictated by some central party, like a company or some community member or anyone like that, everyone is essentially agrees to the terms, right, of these rules. If they decide to enter a DAO, they decide to buy a token, right, that has governance rights attached to it. And everyone's agreeing on these rules that are completely transparent and open because these are just on-chain smart contracts. And folks realize that coordinating capital coordinating talent and contributions was really, really easy if you actually structured these rules beforehand and it opened the doors to access, enabled anyone to essentially like crowd, crowd the space. So we've seen over the last year, especially starting with the distribution of governance tokens by large decentralized finance protocols like Uniswap and Compound, et cetera, We've seen the idea of DAOs completely explode over the last year. Why? Because people started realizing that it wasn't, you know, the rules that were set weren't only enforcing like contract upgrades and some of the major protocols that already existed. These rules could actually be set and used by any type of online community, any type of digital community. So what we essentially saw, and here I'm going to use um, this super handy chart that our, our friend Cooper put together. We saw this, like over the last year, we've seen this explosion in different use cases for DAOs. And as you can imagine, there's like a huge spectrum of like how decentralized they are, how autonomous they are. And if you can even compare them to an organization, right? A lot of these are just online communities. Some of them are structuring themselves more like organizations, but they're essentially just digital orgs that are that live online with this set of rules that are is enforced online um, on chain. So what we one of the initial use cases that we saw was investment DAOs uh, evolved because they're you know that has a very simple set of rules attached to it. Everyone pulls capital together and via a vote on-chain vote, you decide what to invest in. Um, then you started seeing the expansion of grants DAOs. And now with this NFT boom, right, you're also seeing a ton of collector DAOs um, evolve where people curate NFT portfolios through token voting systems. You also have protocol DAOs. These were some of the originals as well, right? A lot of DeFi protocols that essentially focus on upgrading the contracts or the code itself with these massive treasuries that they're accruing from fees. And a lot of them are also deciding how to allocate that treasury, right, through voting systems. And the newer types of DAOs as well that that popped up include service DAOs. These are literally pools of talented individuals that are really good at one thing, right? Could be marketing, could be development, could be pretty much anything. And they structure themselves as a DAO and service other companies or service other DAOs, pool the revenue collected together in a shared treasury and distribute that to all the members of, the, of that DAO, right? Completely remotely, completely online. It's pretty, it's getting pretty crazy, right? It's super exciting. And, you know, the last one is now, you know, social DAOs as well. You're seeing um, involved with social tokens, uh, folks are gating access, right, to discords. Folks are gating access to different communities, different levels of a community through these voting mechanisms, through these on-chain actions. But again, a lot of this activity also happens off-chain. So, you know, where does boredom fit into all of this, right? It's, it's like a super complex. Well, this huge demand in the types of DAOs that has exploded has also pulled up, you know, a lot of infrastructure. There's been a ton of infrastructure that's been developed around creating tools for these, the honestly, the future of the organization, right? The future of, of the digital community where we envision that there's going to be thousands, tens of thousands, not millions of these digital communities all functioning as different types of DAOs floating in the ecosystem. Of course, because we live in this open, you know, open source um, environment and uh, ecosystem, what you see is a ton of experimentation with the underlying open primitives, with the governance primitives, the types of on the contracts that are being spun up, um, the processes. Um, one of the earlier ones, for example, was Governor Bravo from the Compound team. They open sourced the contract so anyone could fork it. And what you had was this explosive growth and experimentation around that contract. Um, the original contract had a set of parameters. You have a two-day voting period with a two-day time lock. And after that, if you have a majority vote, the code executes. What you saw is teams just take that, tweak it you know, to their liking based on their use case, and from there, deploy their own what we call governance framework, right, or governance process on chain, depending on what their use case was, how their community existed. So what we've seen is this like also massive explosion. Um, hopefully you guys can see this, okay. Um, massive explosion in the DAO infrastructure stack too. You've seen the proliferation of all these different governance frameworks um, essentially evolve for different types of use cases. Snapshot, for example, is a very, very lightweight client that's completely handled off chain, just takes a snapshot at a, at a certain block height um, and allows people to vote based on their token holdings, right? Or different strategies. Moloch is a bit more complex. It's an on-chain contract with exit mechanisms. Aragon is like a 
a way more complex set of smart contracts. So anyway, all of these primitives have evolved to give people optionality where if they want to spin up a DAO, they can actually pick and choose, you know, what systems and tools to use based on their use case and kind of like, you know, almost through like governance Lego blocks, right? Or decision-making Lego blocks, coordination Lego blocks, put together the process that's be that best suits their, their goals and their motivations. A social DAO that has token gating on Discord handles a lot of their decision-making off-chain. So they need a very, very lightweight solution. So they'll probably deploy using Snapshot. But one of the larger pro projects like Uniswap, with billions of dollars in treasury and super complex, you know, uh, contracts and, and then honestly a little bit of a need to upgrade the code sometimes um, or just to figure out treasury allocations and distributions, they might use a more secure version of a framework that completely lives off chain, uh, on chain and has high, high like participation requirements, right? Or quorum requirements. Um, and that could be Bravo or that could be Moloch, et cetera. So anyway, well, you know, what we saw at Boardroom was this huge explosion of tooling around DAOs, not only in the governance frameworks themselves, but also treasury tooling around paying the people in your community, you know, payroll distribution, storing asset management, et cetera, around work structures. How do you actually reward contributors? How do how how do you measure contributions in these online communities where you don't even know who these people are sometimes, right? They're completely anonymous. So what we at Boardroom saw is a really interesting opportunity to start developing a platform um, that standardized a lot of those interactions, created an interoperability framework across these, these all these different tools to enable a participant to have a much easier time of actually interacting with these DAOs, no matter, no matter what set of tools they're using. In the past, um, each one of these tools had completely different interfaces from discussions to treasury management to governance and voting, right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, especially starting with governance and voting, which was the first, you know, real use case for DAOs. You had to access all of these different interfaces with completely different UX, completely different, a completely different experience for the end user. And it was really confusing because you don't really don't didn't know what the parameters were, how to vote, how much voting power you had, if you had to do anything beforehand, if you have to install five MetaMask walls, you know, who knew? So what we are building and, and uh, Brandon can dive into this a little bit, uh, a little bit more, is an interoperability framework to actually standardize the interactions across all these tools and be able to aggregate, um, as you can see up top, you know, boardroom stands up top here, aggregate all these different interactions, especially when it comes to governance and voting mechanisms into, you know, a single platform. And then on top of that platform, we've built a set of APIs and our, you know, what we consider the reference UI implementation of that platform, our flagship product is the boardroom dashboard, right? That acts as a homepage, an aggregation portal for the DAO ecosystem. So from that, from that UI, you can actually interact with all these different DAOs. You can view your voter profile. You can cast your votes across all of these different DAOs. And you can also map all of these DAO to DAO interactions. So for the end user, for me, the normal passive stakeholder that has some of these tokens, the natural question to ask after I interact with all these, you know, um, DAOs and I'm holding, you know, five or six different tokens in my wallet is aside from trading and speculation, what can I actually do with this token? <laughs> right. And what we want to do is really provide an interface to the boardroom portal where you can just connect your wallet and actually find out, you know, what you can do for the, you, it's usually related to voting and decision-making around a specific protocol or process. But again, it's, it's a really interesting position to, to be put in because DAOs are the stru like structure, essentially like are the development of the infrastructure of how these protocols actually coordinate. So it's all this infrastructure and all these this tools is like a completely applicable to every single use case, to every project in the space that has some semblance of like decentralization or like a flat structure. So we're really building kind of like the rails, right? For, to enable all these folks to coordinate effectively in, in the digital realm. With that being said, I want to, you know, dive into boredom a little bit more, but before that, I wanted to stop just to see in case uh, any, if any of you guys have like questions or comments or anything you wanted to dive in a bit deeper on. I know it's a super high level and there's so many things that we can discuss around that. So I'm curious if anyone has any questions. Um, this morning, if not, we can dive into, um, you know, what we're doing at boardroom. All right. Um, just from DAOs, uh, from tokens or DEXs. Um, yeah. So we actually worked with, uh, so how, how do we expect, um, companies to transition to a lot of DAOs? Um, yeah. So this is super fascinating because we actually worked with Shapeshift, um, on their transition and we're acting as the native governance UI. I think there's going to be, you know, a point where the infrastructure is solid enough that, um, most companies and most structures, especially obviously like, you know, Web3 and crypto native are going to go first, um, but most companies are going to want to structure 
or at the very least distribute a bit of power to you know the stakeholders that they represent. We've seen that like these DAO structures are way, way more scalable than traditional company structures. And they're way more representative of the users um, as well that are actually building the product. So instead of focusing on you know building a product first and then selling it to your users, what you're getting is like a you know a feedback loop because the users are actually the owners of your platform now, right? If if you're actually structured as a DAO. So it's been fascinating to see that the users almost get to dictate the product at a much closer degree. Um, the traditional company structures, and this is what Shapeshift told us too, that they really wanted to push power as much as possible back to the users of their decks, right, uh, or their aggregator decks. So I, you know, I think there's definitely going to be like a ton, a huge trend emerge of, you know, for folks to to start transitioning as soon as possible. The thing is that right now the infrastructure is in there, right, especially for the larger companies as well that need a semblance of disclosure and have responsibilities and fiduciary duties that doesn't exist yet. All right, so. Before I answer any more questions, uh, Brandon, I'm curious if you want to give like a quick um, overview of like the SDK and the Boredom API, um, just so we can dive into like how, you know, how Boredom is actually structured and what it looks like. Um, and then I'm going to keep answering, you know, questions as well um, as we as we get to that. Totally. Yeah. Um, I, I really like those last two questions too, about uh, using a DAO to raise for a film and then specifically about uh, serving the general public too. So um, if you don't get to this, Kevin, I'll, I'll circle back to this at the end. But uh, to introduce myself, I'm Brandon. I am the architect over at Boardroom. My kind of technical background is coming from the trad tech world. I did lots of cloud stuff uh, in the past, and that's what I actually continue to do here at Boardroom. So kind of what Kevin was talking about, he kind of outlined, here's what a DAO is. It's all this kind of really interesting way of coordinating in a more digitally native way, super exciting stuff. And just like he mentioned, and kind of showed in that infographic, there's already been quite an explosion of DAOs recently, and, and that will only to uh, continue to accelerate. So as we see more traditional companies beginning to explore kind of coordinating in a more digital native way, as we see more and more organizations moving to kind of a, a crypto native approach to coordinating stuff, we'll see them grow quite a bit. And so on top of that, in addition to just growing in number, we're going to see their approach to coordination change and evolve over time. Right now, and how things kind of started at the very beginning of all this was really straightforward. You had a token, you could vote on stuff and you can move some funds around. But as people are beginning to experiment with different approaches to this, as different types of communities need to be able to coordinate uh, and maybe a way that isn't so closely related to a shareholder voting kind of setup, we're going to see the ways that DAOs operate shift quite a bit as well. So that kind of double-edged ed problem of DAOs growing and, and their complexity and use cases growing as well, Boardroom is trying to position ourselves kind of right in the middle of all of that to look around and understand what's happening with these DAOs, what are they trying to do, what are they looking to accomplish, what are some of the challenges of you know, working or contributing to several DAOs and understanding what's happening, and, and trying to provide ways to aggregates and kind of connect all that information together in a in a useful way. So like Kevin said, we focus really on the interoperability piece and the aggregation piece. So interoperability is this idea that um, you know, different DAOs have different types of mechanisms to coordinate and interact, something as simple as creating a proposal and being allowed to vote on that. That is handled different ways across different DAOs. But if you think about it at the core, it's kind of like a common set of functionality. So that's the interoperability piece. On the aggregation side, it's really useful to understand um, voter interactions across all these different projects. So Kevin's got up on the screen right now, kind of a selection of all the, the projects that we have integrated on inside of Boardroom. And it's useful to understand, okay, I'm, I'm Brandon, I'm a voter, I've contributed these various DAOs or I've, I've weighed in or I have stake in these DAOs. What is my voting history like? Um, how do I tend to vote? How long have I been a voter? What protocols am I actively involved in? So being able to kind of get an idea of what that looks like across the board and not just for uh, a certain type of framework, but across multiple different types of frameworks um, is a very useful thing. So it's interesting, it's exciting. You'll hear a lot of people talk about this notion of on-chain reputation. So instead of having a LinkedIn profile that you have to maintain, there is gonna be this sort of digital immutable trail of your contributions to the space, whether that's through how you've uh, participated in governance or other sorts of interactions. I think we're just starting to see just the very beginning of how some of that stuff is gonna work, which is super exciting. So what Boredom is really trying to do is, is it's, it's like I said, creating this interoperability layer, this aggregation layer overall. Kevin's got um, the Boardroom portal up right now, which is our front end application. 
This is presenting uh, users, uh, this would be for token holders to be able to go in, see what kind of proposals are up for their protocols and be able to vote and participate in, in this governance process, basically. It's kind of diving onto the tech side, what's underneath this front end app, this is a React application, very similar to how anything would be built for the most part in kind of a web two world is we have a centralized API underneath that. Um, that's just called the boardroom API. And that is built in a very similar way to pretty much any other centralized API. This is a very traditional web stack setup. It's a REST API over HTTP, very straightforward. What gets really interesting is underneath this, inside of the API, we have what's called the governance SDK. That's our interoperability layer. And that is a portable JavaScript library that talks to all the very cool Web3 stuff downstream from all that. So that's making requests to the blockchain. That is querying other third-party APIs. It's even sometimes talking to other Web2 APIs. Um, just because the different ways that these protocols are running their governance, you can get that information kind of from all over the place. That's part of the challenge. Um, that we're trying to solve uh, here at Boardroom is trying to make this easier to work around. So that stack of having the Boardroom portal powered by the Boardroom API, powered by our SDK, that's kind of um, our technical approach to handling this kind of crazy ecosystem of DAOs that continue to pop up. The crucial part of that is that the SDK um, is designed in such a way so that we can open source it and start leveraging community authored integration. That's kind of the scalability piece of this because as more DAOs begin to pop up as their frameworks and kind of coordination surface area, so to speak, gets more and more complex, it's important that we can scale to continue to uh, accommodate all of those. And so we're right now in the process of spinning up kind of our uh, builder skilled basically to onboard people to be able to contribute to that SDK, to be able to maintain integrations and really have kind of an authoritative stance on how they map their operations and their governance into our interoperability framework, basically. So that's the gist of kind of the, the boardroom come from a product perspective and a tech stack perspective. Yeah, um, so uh, starting with Gabriella, your question I think is really interesting. Um, so a lot of times you can think of DAOs as, as they are servicing their own communities, maybe the token holders um, and, and kind of rewarding them in, in various ways potentially, but. A lot of times DAOs are, are built in such a way to build, maintain, and guide public goods in a lot of ways. Like the, I think there's a lot of um, pretty large examples we can look at right now. And that's something as simple as like maybe Uniswap or even Compound. So Compound is a completely trustless protocol. Anyone can go and use that. That really is a, a, a global public good in the same way that like a, a park or a library even really is because it's open to anyone to use. And so you kind of have the, the stewarding of these goods and the kind of configuration of the protocol kind of entrusted to the DAO as they're using that. But the value that they're providing is the outward facing value for the community that's using that because everyone can go and use Uniswap, everyone can go and use Compound. And that's why it's really exciting. In fact, you know, it's, it's interesting if you think about like why does the Compound token um, or the Uniswap token, why does that work so much when you aren't even getting dividends or anything like that? And it's just the value of having uh, the ability to impact, control, and vector such an important protocol uh, has some intrinsic value, basically. And that's where the value of the token comes from. So that's kind of an interesting piece there is that a lot of times DAOs really are building these things that can be used by the, the larger public, not just catering to their members uh, on the inside. I don't know if that totally made sense, but if it, if it doesn't, happy to answer any follow-up questions uh, on that because I think it's a super interesting perspective and question on that. The, the other question about using a DAO to raise funds, I think that's awesome. Uh, there's so, so, so many cool and exciting ways to uh, raise and deploy capital on chain. That gets very tricky and I absolutely have no idea how that works when it comes kind of to the regulation and the legal side of all that of when you start trying to move those funds out uh, into a legal entity like a, like a, like a film or any sort of um, you know, real life venture versus stuff that's strictly on chain. So that gets pretty tricky pretty fast, but I know there are lots of uh, like legal venues for, for doing stuff like that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And on the point of like um, scaling past your community, I think um, it's really fascinating to see how the, you know, DAOs are starting to become structured in, in, you know, different representative kind of like groups of members, right? So there's always going to be a core team, this managerial focused core team that's really interacting with the DAO 24 seven. They're really driving the innovation. Um, and a really good, uh, representation that I recently saw on, on Twitter is actually the DAOs are, you know, um, a hundred member communities that are supported by tens of thousands, you know, potentially of stakeholders. And what, you know, we really want to do, it's, it's obvious that not everyone that owns a token or everyone that's involved in a community is going to be able to actually make every single minuscule decision about where that community goes, how the protocol distributes treasury, et cetera. 
And what we're seeing is that these core team members that are driving things um, are essentially doing so in a completely transparent way now, right? Because everything is on chain or everything's using some sort of like governance framework. So the big shift from like traditional corporations as well is that now the token holders, which are hopefully, you know, if you distributed the token correctly, your stakeholders, your users, your the folks that are somehow impacted by that, you know, protocol, that community, um, actually have like an accountability mechanism to a certain extent now, right? For the for the manage for the for the more core contributors as well, um, because everything is transparent, everything is handled on chain, and there's recourse for the underrepresented stakeholder, usually the majority of stakeholders, to actually make their voices heard, you know, or have some sort of like exit mechanism, right? Or some recourse mechanism um, to vote and engage in these decisions that are gonna in, end up impacting them, right? So a structure that's much more, that much more resembles like a co-op than its traditional corporation, but all handled on chain, which is super fascinated, as super fascinating, and that can scale dramatically quickly. So when it comes to expanding outside of your core community, what you really wanna do is like engage the general public Public so long as they're somehow impacted, right, by what you're building and have some sort of governance mechanism or some sort of like uh, process or system where they can influence decisions that they want. It doesn't mean that they have to interact with every decision, uh, but it means that they have to have some mechanism to actually be able to, to take a part in the process. So I think as we're seeing DAOs expand from just a couple thousand members to tens of thousands, I mean, I, I think the Uniswap drop had like 400,000 right, um, token holders. We're seeing that not everyone's gonna be, in, be able to interact, but everyone now has a way to actually make their voices heard, which is super fascinating. And mostly users, you know, mostly users, but depending on like who you wanna distribute power here as well. Another quick question. Is there a reason that the app is architected like a web too? Oh, yeah, I'm going to let Brandon and Zach take that one. Totally. Yeah, um, that is a super great question and something I actually had that I wanted to make sure to cover. So um, I appreciate you asking that. So yeah, the application from um, for most of the interactions here uh, that you're looking at on the on the web site to the API, that is going to look just like a web two stack uh, for the most part. Um, the reason why is um, a lot of the information that you can get on chain, we can query directly, but a lot of it is a little bit more complicated or heavy to actually get to um, and require some indexing. So this would be things like being able to understand, like if I just wanted to get an idea of my voting history across all of the, you know, 60 something protocols we support. The being able to do that directly by querying an RPC node isn't feasible um, in any kind of way from a front end. You need an indexing layer basically in front of that. Um, there are more uh, kind of Web3 native approaches to indexing. If y'all are familiar with the graph, it's uh, kind of a moving towards a decentralized approach towards indexing, it uses GraphQL, lots of very cool tech. That's something we actually looked into doing and some other projects do, but it didn't suit our needs either because of the uh, types of data that we were ingesting and the aggregation patterns that we we're looking to do still isn't feasible with something like the graph. So what that led us to is that, yes, we're gonna have to build a centralized API, one of the reasons we also did that is um, for high availability and uptime. So something like the graph, which is an interesting indexing service, um, there can be uptime issues with that and, and there can be problems with that. So approaching this like kind of a traditional web stack um, that connects to Web3 on the back end was our, was our approach for the most part. So the SDK, that kind of interoperability layer that I was talking about, the SDK's job is to talk to all those cool Web3 things. That's where it's making direct smart contract calls um, and, and calling out to all these external data sources. And it's kind of projecting that data back so that the traditional Web2 centralized uh, platform basically can index that information, which is pretty cool. So um, there are places in the front end where it does directly interact on chain. Um, we do some really cool stuff. Like if you're casting a vote, um, that actually uses the SDK directly in the front end. And so um, if you're voting on something like Snapshot, it's gonna pop open your wallet so you can do a signature and that's it. It'll post to a Web2 API after that. Uh, but if you go to vote on Compound or Aave or some of these other on-chain frameworks, um, you're going to actually be directly submitting a transaction to the blockchain from the front-end application. So it's a little bit of both, um, and it's a hybrid on that. And in fact, um, talking to other builders in the space, and, and I'm actually pretty new to, to crypto myself too, and it, it was interesting kind of learning the approaches on all this, is that whenever you're building a, like an end-user application, especially especially when one is as rich of interaction and aggregation as the boardroom portal, the reality is you're oftentimes gonna still have a centralized API of sorts just to kind of have that information on there. From an ethos perspective, like a philosophical perspective, the big focus here is, is decentralization overall in the space. The approach that I take as architect is that when you can't have a truly decentralized approach, you can't have something living on chain or you need a centralized server like we do, 
you want to approach that in a way that maximizes reproducibility. So that's our portable SDK. That's our ability to uh, ensure that we have this path to open sourcing that. So all of our kind of uh, business logic, so to speak, is fully out there and other people can use and leverage and build on, contribute to and understand. Uh, furthermore, if you dive into the architecture of the platform itself, it's actually built in such a way that if we had to, and if we wanted to, we can totally open source almost all of the database side of stuff uh, as well. That is fully free of vendor specific uh, cloud provider code, which is super exciting. So it's it's kind of an important pragmatic decision. And in fact, if you end up building a lot in the crypto space, it's gonna be a decision that you're constantly asking yourself of looking towards a decentralized versus a centralized approach to using tech. Yeah, and I think a lot of this also like talks to the point that um, a lot of folks tout the transparency um, as like a huge value prop, right, of DAOs. You can see all this information on chain and you can actually access it just by reading the contracts and seeing the on-chain transactions. The thing is that 95% of stakeholders in the world and token holders and contributors um, don't know how to do that, right? Or won't know how to do that or won't have the time to do that. So what, what another thing that we're also really trying to push with Boardroom is, you know, creating a, a layer that contextualizes a lot of this on-chain information and really enables the majority of stakeholders to ha really have an understanding, a grasp of the types of decisions that are being made without necessarily having to literally learn, you know, every single detail about um, on-chain frameworks and contracts and et cetera, et cetera. Um, because at the end of the day, we really, if we really want these to scale, you know, dramatically and eventually we, we're going to have a large majority of folks that, um, you know, are, are just regular individuals that want to be represented in these decisions. And we need to contextualize this on-chain information as well in a way that's more digestible, right, for the for the average person. Um, so a lot, large part of what we're doing at Boardroom is also just trying to build UX and UI and educational material and informational content, uh, trying to simplify, you know, an understanding of, of what's actually happening in these DAOs. So one other thing that we wanted to discuss as well um, was working in Web3. And, you know, the, what you guys like, you know, should expect and can expect, and, you know, we'd love to draw from some of like our team's experiences as well in making that transition, um, how they found the experience and, you know, some of the differences, you know, that are, that are expected. Obviously the, you know, the crypto community is pretty absolutely insane. It's really early, right? There's huge lack of infrastructure of tooling and of educational material and onboarding. So this is why we're so uh, excited to support Bloom as well. But we wanted to just give you guys our perspective um, on like how we've structured our company, how we built, you know, the culture boardroom as well, but also have um, some folks from our team just kind of like give their experiences. So um, I was wondering, you know, Brandon, Zach Harper, if you guys want to kind of like dive in a little bit into your experience making that jump into Web3, some of the interesting differences that you may have found doing that. And I think you know, guys, please inter like interrupt us at any point with questions, right? Or like, um, you know, if you want to tell us your experience as well, please do so. But yeah, um, guys, do you want to just like dive in real quick into, you know, how you experienced that entire transition? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so for me, I worked in traditional tech for, as an engineer for about 12 years as mostly a front end engineer and got pretty burnt out over the years. Um, a few things that kind of led up to that were just, uh, from a business perspective, I found traditional startups to be, you know, much more of a kind of cutthroat environment, companies kind of like fighting ruthlessly against each other and like not really elevating each other, like like you see in the crypto space. Things kind of move a lot slower. There's a lot more red tape in the process. And then also like things like data hoarding, data is not super accessible in the trad tech world. Uh, most of the interesting data sets are behind paywalls. I think just most a lot of the interesting things that drew me to programming were, were kind of just gone. Um, you know, I, I think over the last 10 years, things just kind of got to a point where a lot of the interesting problems were gone and it wasn't as interesting to work in the trad tech space as it was in 2010. So I got started in crypto about eight months ago. And one of the like, you, you know, one of the like really sick things about working in crypto that I think you just don't see in trad tech is just how open everything is um, because all the data is on the blockchain. You know, comprehensive data is fully accessible. A lot of the API, the first party APIs that teams are building are also fully open. And just in general, I think teams are very open to collaborating. And we found that just from collaborating with these teams, that's really helps kind of drive and guide our vision and idea of what our product even is, um, because it's something that we're still figuring out along the way. Um, you know, I think in a lot of ways, the way that crypto startups run is very different from trad tech startups where we don't have like a super rigid, clear idea of what our product is. We sort of have a like a, a hypothesis, 
and we work with you know our users and other project teams that we're integrating with to get you know feedback along the way and and sort of evolve our project with the community um, as things rapidly evolve in the space. So yeah, I think also just being part of something that's you know completely new and literally being built live right in front of us is is really exciting. Um, I think you can probably find that in a few different verticals in trad tech, but crypto in general, you know, I, I think. You know, you could probably pick any vertical vertical and find like some really interesting problems that just haven't been solved at all on, you know, from the entire stack all the way from the UX side to, you know, front end, back end stuff, um, even just like the product and marketing side, um, a lot of really interesting and novel problems. Yeah, just to add on that. Hey, my name is Harper. Um, I'm a designer here at Boardroom. I kind of just stumbled into crypto um, and kind of had the same experience where working in trad, you kind of already knew where that the future of a company was going. So for example, uh, this one's very tangible. I used to work in the vehicle industry and we were a startup acquired by a Japanese automobile company. Now we know that autonomous cars are not here yet, but we know that we're certainly working towards that in the future. But with crypto, you kind of don't know, and that's the beauty of it. And you can be really transparent, and it's it's a better message to say to users like, we don't know what our roadmap's going to be, even six months from now, because six months is like twenty years in 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 crypto, right? But what we can try to do a better job of is being able to empathize, predict, and just be flexible with how the this nascent space is changing and really take the opportunity to start listening to users and how they're evolving as they incorporate crypto into their lives. Now, the space, as, if, as, as you're starting to dive in, you do notice that it's still a very fragmented um, ecosystem, but the silver lining in that is that you're, you're allowed to help define how we're going to change the landscape of crypto and DAOs and governance and learn from that. And it really forces you to try to think outside the box. And our culture here at Boardroom is we find it very valuable to collaborate and communicate between different roles. It means like if you're in a tech role, be as communicative as possible with someone who's not in a tech role. So I'm a designer, right? But we find it very valuable for, for me and Brandon and Zach to keep spitballing and throwing ideas back at each other because we all have such different perspectives. And so we do really value being able to, when we do grow our team, get people from all corners of the earth, all different stages of, uh, of how they're involved in the crypto space and not forget to come back to how that new user feels. So while we don't have a clear roadmap, um, which is what, I mean, there's a, I think there's a question Aaron was saying, um, we can at least predict for, for things like, okay, so, how do we make this product a little bit more accessible, which is something we think about all the time. So we try to simplify the layers we add to our products. So for example, like right now, what we're lacking is, um, I think Brandon and Kevin earlier mentioned that we want voter pro profiles to feel more like a resume. Now that could involve adding a social layer to that. I don't think things like Facebook, but more like a, a more community-driven philosophy to sharing what you're doing in the space. So that's where we're at now. We definitely don't always have the answer for everything. We're learning as we go. So that feels great. It's really refreshing compared to trad tech. Like it's okay to say, I don't know, but it's also great to continue to lean into what users are lacking and not forgetting how it felt like to have stumbled into crypto on day one. Hope this was slightly insightful to get a peek into to what someone like me um, is going through. So I've been I've only been working this space for I think it's five months now. So pretty new, but you know you might feel like you're lost. But um, the more you get involved, the more you start kind of just piecing together all the little puzzles that you've picked up along the way, and things start to make a little bit more sense. Yeah, it does really feel like everyone in this space is just kind of like learning together as we go because no one really knows what, what to expect and where this is going to grow. And uh, over the years, like the, the narratives have evolved so dramatically um, that's been fascinating to watch. Boardroom is also sitting at a really interesting position, right? Because we're building infrastructure and, you know, the actual process behind every project in the space. So we get to interact with all these different types of narratives and use cases and projects from NFTs to DeFi to, you know, infrastructure plays, the protocols, et cetera. 
um, they all have to figure out how to organize themselves and how to coordinate. Right? And, and we get to build infrastructure for that, which is super fascinating, which is why, as well as Harper mentioned, um, it's really important that everyone on the team is super autonomous. Um, you know, we have a very like results driven environment where you kind of like control what you do and you know what to do best. And we need to like maintain that flexibility on purpose because the, the space and the market just shifts so quickly under our feet. Um, which is really exciting, but also, you know, a pretty big challenge. Yeah, I was going to jump in real quick on the building and Web3 stuff, um, just because, uh, like, like Zach alluded to, and he even wrote a really good blog post on this before I got into crypto that sort of got me hyped, uh, is that I really don't think you can overstate how much more fun it is building in uh, Web3 than it is building in Web2. Everything that you're constructing and that you're building feels far more exciting, far more novel. The problems are a lot more interesting. The people are far more optimistic far more open uh, and far more centered on collaboration and cooperation and coordinating together to build really awesome stuff versus trying to contrive, uh, you know, like really odd kind of company cultures or excuses to build things that you are building when at the end of the day, you're really just building this kind of user extractive profit machine. Could be fun for a little while doing, you know, interesting challenges, but Zach, myself and Harper, we've had um, you know, a very, very long time of building in, the, in that kind of traditional space. And when we got to Boardroom, which is which is our first crypto jobs, and then we all dove into the space, it was such a sense of relief uh, and reinvigorated our kind of uh, passion as builders to, to build really cool stuff. Um, it was just very freeing. So um, I know that some of the people in the Bloom program, at least I believe, are kind of coming from like already working in a traditional tech background. And if you want a really fun reset and feel like you are, uh, you know, just like a, a kid, again, getting to build really cool stuff. Web3 is, is super exciting. And that's that's definitely been a thing that's been my favorite part about all of it. Yeah, not to understate how, like, actually insane the growth in this market is going to be. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be pretty pretty crazy to watch this evolve. We're already seeing it, but, like, uh, before our own eyes. And um, just being able to apply kind of, like, knowledge, right, from, like, your your past experience to this completely, like, blue ocean. It's so fascinating. Yeah, it's, as Brandon mentioned, it's literally like being a kid again. Um, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so how do you think um, a college student um, can enter the crypto world? Because um, I'm really interested in getting an internship so I can see you know, what it's like firsthand, but I know the space is always rapidly changing. And um, a lot of the teams probably don't have enough um, hands on deck for like mentorship or whatever. So how do you think a college student should, should approach that landscape? Yeah, I think that's an awesome question. Um, and I can take it unless someone else wanted to, to jump in. But um, for one, I'm sure it feels super intimidating to look at all this crazy tech and how fast stuff is moving and feel like, uh, wow, like I gotta, I really gotta catch up first and then maybe I can dive in. Um, but honestly, it's, it's kind of the opposite a little bit. And I actually had this in my notes of sort of the web two versus web three. And when I think of web two and, and specifically around technical contributors uh, in their kind of career, is so many people had this very linear kind of perspective on it where you start as a junior dev, you move to a senior and you do this and this blah, blah, blah. And your sort of LinkedIn history and how many years you've been working is really what determines your viability as a candidate. Whereas in Web3, because everything is so new, this tech didn't even exist uh, that long ago. And literally every week something new comes out and there's a paradigm shift, which means we're all beginners again on this. And so a lot of times being earlier in your career, um, kind of having a fresher look on things and not having these sort of jaded perspectives on how you build and how you construct and how you work together as builders, um, that's actually a, a gigantic advantage. And so I don't know if that's really advice <laughs> exactly, if that's what you're looking for, um, but really just lean in, build cool stuff, talk to cool people, you know, wear your emotions on your on your sleeve or whatever the expression is and show your enthusiasm. And that's what most teams are looking for is, is people that are excited, people that are enthusiastic, people that are optimistic about what it is that you're doing. Because at the end of the day, the, the building part is, is just, you know, throwing some code around at the end of the day. And that's the sort of stuff you can pick up on the job because every single one of us is still learning and none of us are keeping up. So it's just a matter of jumping in when you can and, and contributing, even if you're at the very beginning of your career. I think another thing is to like, if you really love a certain community, let's say NFTs, jump into their Discord and look into the dev channel or anywhere that might need help. Because a lot of these things are really open source. Like, for example, um, there's Screensaver World and it's 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 also an NFT community, but they're they're really like, you know, they they're looking for people to help them improve everything. 
And um, even with Brandon's own project, it's called Vibes, um, he's trying to also improve that community for his screensaver. So if you look for those projects you're really passionate about, dive in there, go to their Discord. And this is an informal way to go about an internship. It's better to like build that experience because it's a lot more like self-starting. And I think that's what these uh, hiring companies want to see because crypto is like, the, the good thing about this landscape is like they're more interested in people who are trying to go about something completely new, get into uncharted territory and, and, and getting in themselves. So this is going to give you a much higher chance into getting where you want to be. So I definitely encourage you to find those projects. Yeah, and Julia, Gitcoin Kernel is an awesome program. Super fans, and um, if anyone here, like you guys, should definitely reach out. I think that's a really great example of how much the space has evolved. There's so much uh, educational content and supportive uh, programs as well now that you know I'm sure Val remembers like a couple years ago that def definitely did not exist. <laughs> um, but what you see now is that all of these companies and all of these DAOs and all these programs are so are fiending for talent to the point where it's really, really important for them to support you in like that learning experience, right? And like that learning transition. And we're already seeing it like with, with DAOs like Index and all these other ones, they have internship programs, right? Where you get, um, I mean, even boardroom, right? Like educational stipends and, um, you know, you can send them for programs and kind of like learn along the way and even spend like half of your time literally just learning the space or learning something that you're passionate about. And as Harper mentioned, um, if you also, you know, start by first looking at like communities that you're passionate um, about and, and really want to dive in there, there's going to be now like we've seen develop these supportive structures around education, onboarding, et cetera, across the board. There's, you know, at least 10, 20 programs that are completely independent or sponsored by different uh, projects. DAOs are spinning up their own internship programs uh, for learning experiences. And there's always going to be like the space over the last year and a half really realized that it's so crucial. Right, to like build this, these supportive systems um, around onboarding new folks to the space, no matter kind of like their level of experience. Um, so even though we're all kind of like learning together at the same pace, there are a ton of programs you can get involved with. And, and yeah, as Harper mentioned, it's really just starting, like contributing wherever you can, trying to dive into the communities that you're really interested in. And, you know, if it doesn't exist, like all of these um, companies and DAOs will definitely sponsor all these educational programs. I know at least like, five grant DAOs, right, that are already like uh, funding educational accelerator programs. And um, there's there's obviously a lot of capital in the space right now. So these programs are spinning up left and right. Um, so luckily now we have the infrastructure, right, to support a lot of that learning too, um, which is also super fascinating. You really can't find that um, that dramatically, I think, in other industries. You know, I just wanted to say that, yes, as mentioned in the chat a couple of times, we do have like a, a running hackathon right now that folks can get like involved in and kind of get their hands dirty with you know, using our API and we have a ton of awesome co-sponsors. If you guys want to learn any more about like diving into DAOs or what they are or how they're impacting the industry, how to get involved, feel free to like jump in our Discord and just like ask questions. There's a ton of like supportive community members in there as well. And uh, again, we're in the super, super early innings, right, of this of this narrative as well. The DAOs have been around for a while, but we haven't really seen the application of them until like a couple of years ago. And now they're just exploding. And they're related to every single use case, every single narrative. There's so many different types of communities and DAOs that are spinning up. So now is honestly the best time to just like get your hands dirty and dive in. And there are really going to be like these supportive educational programs as well to help you onboard. But that's also, you know, part of the reason why we're building boardroom, right? We want to enable that information. We want to enable that digestible information around onboarding and, and getting folks involved in DAOs. So I think everyone's also kind of like building this in, in parallel. Hop in the boardroom discord and happy to answer any questions on DAOs or building a web three or any of that sort of stuff. So definitely, definitely like connecting with people that are at the very beginning of their journey, because for, for all of us, that wasn't that long ago for us either. So it's still pretty familiar what that transition was like for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah, all definitely right, guys. We're all very open. So just send us questions in boardroom. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, please ping us with anything in the meantime. Um, this is super, we're super excited about the, the Bloom program and how that's moving forward. And we'll keep an eye out for, for any of you guys joining the Discord too.